Today, we are going to be discussing endgames. The most neglected part of chess, the most important fun of chess, the most fun part of chess, in my opinion. You know what endgames remind me of? They remind me of when you like solve Sudoku on a plane. They're just like little puzzles. The nice thing about endgames, though sometimes annoying to deal with, it's just a bunch of basic rules, but you need to know when to apply those rules. And there's so many rules, that's what makes them difficult. So we're going to be starting with rook endgames as they are the most common in chess. We're going to be discussing drawn king and pawn endings, what constitutes that, winning rook and pawn endgames, what constitutes that. We're going to be discussing pawns on the 7th. So I broke it down in easy, the rook and the draw, medium, pawn on the 7th, and then difficult, Lasker's maneuver. So if you know the first two, skip to the end and watch Lasker's Maneuver. I promise you it will not disappoint. It's a very amazing rook end game and it, it's cyclic, meaning that it's a cycle of moves that leads you to a win. So let's get into it. Okay, now in this position, white's pawn is going down. White's rook is cutting our king on the eighth. White's king is trying to march down alongside the pawn to escort it and black has to draw this we know it constitutes a draw because black's king is directly on the queening square that is the best possible square you want your king when you're down a pawn and you're trying to draw now a common mistake people make is for example going rook to e3 check the reason this would be a mistake is it allows white to gain a tempo meaning after king to d6 black has no more checks and all of a sudden white is threatening mate the critical rank is the sixth file. The critical square on the sixth rank would be opposing your own king, hiding on the pawn, no checks. So it's very hard to stop mate. For example, if black moves his rook away, checkmate in one. The king replaces the job that the rook was doing, which means it's guarding the seventh, and black gets checkmated on the eighth. You might say, okay, well, I can just go rook e8, and he's not threatening checkmate. This is true. However, white here can swing his rook along the other side, the opposite end of the board, and now black cannot bring his rook to guard against the king. The only move they have to stop checkmate is king to c8, and now rook to a8. The king is forced out to b7. They lose the rook, and with that, they lose the game. Now you might say, okay, well, what if I just, you know, leave my rook somewhere on the e-file so that when they give a check, I block it. Yes, you're trading rooks, which seems to be good, but you're also losing the opposition. If white's king progresses to the 7th rank, he guards the 6th, 7th, and 8th, allowing the pawn to promote. And after this rook trade, black is forced to give up a square on the 7th rank, allowing white's king to come in. White guards the 6th, 7th, and 8th. This pawn now cannot be stopped. So that is the explanation as to why you don't want to give checks. It's a common misconception. Checks are often one-move threats in endgames. What you want to do is box the enemy king out. Give it the side of the board that is irrelevant. So, for example, you know white's king wants to go to the 6th rank. King needs to be in front of the pawn for the pawn to promote. So what do we do? We bring our rook to the 6th rank. And now the king cannot make progress. And that is good for the side that is trying to draw. If white tries sliding their rook on the 7th, we would just slide the rook on the 6th. If there's no progress being made in the position, that helps the person that's trying to draw. The way they're going to try to make progress is by pushing the pawn to the 6th rank. Their idea in doing so is to use the pawn as a shield, right? If the king gets to e6 and our rook is just not doing anything on the 6th rank, then all the squares are going to be covered. White will be threatening mate once again. But the, the benefit to black when the pawn reaches d6 is that the king can no longer go in front of the pawn. Now you bring the rook as far from the king as possible. That is the rule, that is the principle. We'll talk about why you bring it as far as possible, why a1 is better than a2. We'll get there. King to e6, threatening checkmate in one, but lucky for black, we have unlimited amount of checks, right? If the king stays around the pawn, we're just gonna chase it all over. There's just an unlimited amount of checks. You might say, what if it goes, runs to the corner and uses its own rook for coverage? Well, then the king travels too far away from the pawn, so we would just scoop up the pawn. Even if the king just goes over here, no rook trade, but we don't need a rook trade. We're going to pick up the pawn. They guard, we attack, we collect the pawn, we win, or we draw. Sorry, that's a win, though. Now, 
the reason we bring the rook as far from the king as possible is because it makes the king travel the furthest distance away from the pawn, meaning it's easiest for us to collect when the king chases our rook. So that is how to draw a king and pawn endgame when your king is on the right square. Now we're going to go over a winning king and rook endgame. So I made it a little more complex, uh, leaving some extra pieces on the board, but good concepts are going to be grasped from this. What do we notice? Well, we notice that we are opposing black's king, meaning black's king can't go to the fourth rank. We are one away from promoting, they are one away from promoting. So if we take the pawn, they take the pawn. We don't need to, however. We give a check on the third, they cannot go to the fourth, meaning they have to stay on the second. Now we take check, big difference. Now, if they go king g3, we are still going to give this check because drawing their king further away to a more irrelevant part of the board is only going to buy us time in the ending. Even if it doesn't make a difference, it's good to do out of principle. If they go king f3, it's an even more beautiful check because it would pass the king back to the second rank. Now, we need to guard this pawn. You do not want to go rook to b7. Even if it's winning, it's just not good on principle. Their king is going to go to the third rank. You want to guard it with your king. Now assume they're going to give a check, and you're going to move your king. They're going to stop the pawn from promoting. You're going to protect the pawn, so it can promote. Now they're going to give a check, and this brings us to the winning idea, which is getting the king in front of the pawn. See, in the draw, Black's king was blockading the pawn, so it was a draw. Here, Black's king is so far out of the game, so far removed, that it allows White's king to get in front of the pawn. And remember what this does. This gains a tempo. There are no more checks. So black can make any move on the board, and now the winning configuration is to bring your rook on the 5th. Pawn on the 7th, king on the 8th, rook on the 5th to bring the king on the 6th. It's called building a bridge. They might try to bring their king closer, but then we threaten to promote. They're going to give a check, we go to the 6th, they cannot stop our pawn from promoting, they can give one more check, and this is the drawing configuration. It is called building a bridge. So you bring your rook over on the 5th, king on the 6th, pawn on the 7th, they cannot stop you from promoting. And that is a winning rook and pawn ending and what constitutes it. Now we're going to go to medium difficulty. Pawns on the 7th. So you've heard it, rook pawns are bad. However, there are winning ideas even with the most drawage pawns in endgames in chess. So the problem here is that if you move the rook, they're going to collect the pawn. And you don't have any tricks like rook check because they take and they're still covering the promotion square. You would need their king on the sixth. You would need some distance for that to work. So what we do here is we actually go f5. Seems counterintuitive. You're up a pawn and you're giving that pawn away. Why would you do this? Reason being is if they take it, which probably they will do, you're going to give up yet another pawn. And the reason is to expose black's king on the seventh. Now you're able to rotate your rook over towards the other side of the board. And after rook takes pawn, rook check, you are going to pick up the rook. So the rule is you want to draw their king, and typically they're going to have to chase the pawn to collect it, past the knight's file. Anytime it's on the bishop file or over, you're able to slide your rook over to the other end of the board and get this x-ray check picking up the rook. So it's a very beautiful concept in chess. If they try to check you, that's not a check. If they try to check you, you just bring your king closer to them and it's gonna become even easier. Eventually they're going to need to move their rook somewhere. You can even chase it again. They're gonna to need to move their rook somewhere. You're just gonna take, and again, the same rule applies. You know, they might take this pawn, but this does not work. You can do many things here. G takes F7 is probably the cleanest. You're threatening to promote. They would need to take. Now you just come over here, and again, threatening to promote. They can't even stop it. As long as you know your rook and king checkmates, you would be good. So try to draw their king past the knight's file, anywhere bishop file or over. You can come around the other end once you open it up, and you'll win the rook because of the x-ray vision. Another position that is similar to that one is this one. Pawn is one away from promoting. Okay, they have a pawn on the other end of the board, but our king is easily in that queening box, so we're never going to need to worry about that pawn. Our pawns are much further up the board. So the winning idea over here is to play pawn to b6. You're either going to push and promote, or they're going to take. What would you do after they take? Well, 
their king is past the knight's file, right? Bishop file or over. You can go rook to the opposite end of the board safely. You're either going to promote and win the rook that way, or they're going to take and you're going to win the rook this way. And again, their pawns are so disconnected that you easily just take both of them. And then as long as you know your king and rook checkmate, you are good. So that is medium difficulty. Now we're going to go to high level difficulty. And you see it's going to involve a lot of the same concepts. So this is a la this is called the Lasker's Maneuver. It's when both sides are one away from promoting. White's king is one directly in front of the pawn. Their king is more where they need it to be. You can tell they have the edge. It is also white to move. Now, if you go king to d7, um, draw because they could just go king to b7, You they may promote with check. You would take and they would have nothing better but to take your other pawn. King and rook is always going to be a draw. Just don't blunder with something like this because then they're going to check your king away from the rook, take and be winning. You're going to need to get your rook to safety and there's no way they can win this position. You might be a little scared because your king ends up on the A file, but as long as your rook is on the C file, their king can never make progress alongside their rook, so they could never checkmate you. So what do we do? Well, we know it's all about pushing the king away. You don't want their king to get any closer to this pawn. We're going to go king B8. What this move does is it continues to box black's king out. It also creates a threat. The threat is we are threatening to promote the pawn. They're going to slide over and give you a check. It is their only move to prolong the game. We do not want to go back because it would be a draw. Eventually, it would repeat itself. So we go king a8. In essence, this is a tempo gainer because they have no more checks. The kings are opposite each other. You're cutting off the seventh rank. You're still threatening to promote. So they need to stop you from promoting. What do we do when our kings are opposite each other? Well, you know you want their king. You want to create a smaller box. So you check them backwards. Now their king is going to be on a more irrelevant part of the board, which will help white. Now, one move loses immediately. The other move is a cyclic loss. It'll take some time. The move that loses immediately is king to b5. Can you see why this move is worse? Because it obscures the vision of the rook to white's king. Right? There's no more checks. So how does black stop this threat of promotion? He cannot because this is no longer a check. So that would lose immediately. The better move they have is king to a5. And now, now it's going to take some time. So king to b8 or b both would be good here. Threatening to promote again. Now they're going to give a check. You hide behind the king, gaining a tempo. They need to stop you from promoting. Now you give a check. You force them even, even further back. They cannot go to the b file because that obscures the vision of the rook. So we are going to promote. So they have to go stay on the a file. Now, a nice thing to know is the more active your pieces are, the less active your opponent's pieces are. Because the more jobs your pieces do or the more active your pieces are, the more tied down your opponent's pieces are to dealing with the activity of your own pieces. So between king b6 and king b7, both win. But out of principle, king b7 is better. King b7, this king is doing three things. It's threatening to go to a6, which is where we want it to be. It's guarding the pawn, but it's also threatening to promote. So even though king b6 wins in this position, it's only doing two, two jobs. It, it's threatening to go to a6, where we want it to be, and it is protecting the pawn. But it is not protecting the promotion square of the pawn. So it is still winning. You know, we would, we would take this and then promote. But out of principle, make your pieces do more jobs. King b7 is better than king b6. So you're threatening to promote, they need to give a check, you go back in front of the king, again, gaining a tempo. You might say, what is the point of all this? We're almost there. Again, they cannot go on the b file, that loses immediately, so king to a3. Now we have to go king b6 if we want to make progress. We can only do two jobs. If we do three, we're not able to go to a5, which is where we want our king, gaining that tempo. So we get check, king a5, rook back, rook check. King has to go back. And the point of all of this, it's super fascinating. The point of all this was to actually pin the rook to the king. Do you see how you can exploit the fact that the rook is now on the same rank as the king? It is rook takes f2. So every other time we took the pawn, they would just take our pawn, king and rook versus king and rook. They cannot take our pawn because they are pinned. So they need to take our rook and we make a queen. 
Now, a king and queen versus a king and rook is a theoretical win. I will review how to win these games. The basic concept is to get your king and queen as close to their king as possible. And eventually, they're going to have so few rook moves that one, it's going to be harder to find the perfect move. And two, eventually, they're going to run out of rook moves that will hold the position. You're going to get a fork or you're going to get a mate, one of the two. So I hope you enjoyed this rook endgames. I love endgames. I want to go through pawn endgames, knight endgames, bishop endgames, queen endgames. There's just so much to go through, so many oddities in the position. And it's super fun because it's not memorization, it's understanding. And that's what chess is all about. Now, one thing I wanted to do, back to the basic endgame, you may know this, but I just wanted to show rook to the sixth rank, preventing white's king on the sixth. See how it keeps their king on an irrelevant part of the board. It's kind of doing what they were doing to us. That is what you want to do. Do not give checks. Restrict the enemy king from becoming more aggressive. The king is the most important piece on the end game. You want their king to be less active and less important than so. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Many more end games to come.